Hello, how are you? Welcome to this talk about what I match with my data from principles to implementation. Um, thanks everyone for joining here and also thank you Flame Plain Concepts for giving me this opportunity in this talk. Um, please feel free to post any questions or comments that you uh, may have during this presentation. I will review uh, after, after the presentation is finished. Um, first, to start introducing myself, my name is Blanca Mayayo. I'm product owner for uh, Cedra Data Platform, a uh, data platform developed internally in plain concepts. And um, well, a little bit about my background. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, telecommunication engineer from the University of Zaragoza. And during uh, past positions, I've transitioned to some uh, through some leadership roles in quite big companies, um, helping them on the transformation from project to product, uh, but also DevOps transformation. And this talk, let's see what this talk, how it's going to be divided. So this talk is going to be divided in four main sections. First, we will start exploring the key paradigm shift um, in, in data platform design and development. After that, we, after that, we will review some of the key principles behind the data mesh uh, implementation and where this, is, where this concept is coming from. Next, we will explore some key considerations, like for example, what, what is or what is not a data mesh. And finally, we will explore a practical use case, a business case uh, that we solved following uh, some of these principles of data mesh. So let's explore the, the key trends first. Um, <clears throat> during the latest years, we have seen big disruptive changes in application development and architectures, and more specifically in big data platforms. Uh, why? There are some factors here, some trends. On, on one hand, companies are, are being pushed to differentiate and provide value, value that is directly related from the ownership of data. Another one is product thinking, but applied to data. So it's basically about owning the performance and the spread of use of the data. Data as a service can be considered um, as an urge to make the usage of the data widespread uh, that requires in turn to decentralize and to enable other and other parts of the company to use the data. The democratization of AI, basically uh, what, what we are seeing as the barrier to apply uh, AI into the logic of services is being flattened every day. Another one is data marketplaces. So data marketplaces actually is a concept even beyond data as a service. So it's about enabling uh, different models and views to consume and share the data to foster some kind of a marketplace effect of data producers and data consumers, similar to other platforms and other business models that are um, based on, on a platform um, approach. Uh, of course, data governance and sovereignty, we need to solve, uh, to urgently solve basically uh, enterprise and data governance silos. And also we need to react to a challenging, to a compliance landscape that is ever more challenging. Next, we will see, uh, of course, we have all the decentralization uh, of computing with the edge, IoT, and so on. And finally, as key enablers, uh, we have cloud, we have DevOps and automation. So the data mesh was uh, originally um, proposed by Samak Degami from uh, ThoughtWorks. And she wrote a couple of articles that I would really recommend reading uh, that I've uh, pasted here for your reference. Before going into the principles, let's try to answer the question, what problems that this, uh, does this uh, data platform, uh, sorry, the data mesh approach uh, expect to solve? On one hand, uh, there's clear ownership or uh, no, no unclear, uh, sorry, there's no clear ownership or accountability on the data. Um, I'm thinking about these situations where basically we have uh, centralized data lakes uh, or data warehouses as monoliths, right? Uh, so in those scenarios. In, in this case, when this happens, basically the IT uh, pipelines become the, being the unexpected owners of the data, but not the real teams with the business uh, knowledge, right? Then on, 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 on the other hand, we have lower quality and poorer service metrics, which in the end uh, leads to mistrusting the data, right, for consumption. Another, difficult, another typical symptom is the difficulty in scaling up the organization. Uh, why? Because the, we have a central uh, team of engineering experts that is very difficult to scale, right, across the whole organization. 
And uh, finally, uh, not, not well, even beyond the difficulty in scaling up, we can see also the typical bottlenecks and friction due to a couple monolithic systems, right? In the end, all these symptoms lead to problems in the mid to long term uh, that are basically rework, low usage of the data, and um, finally, a slow innovation or a slow uh, uh, capability to provide value. So now let's explore the key principles. Uh, the data approach, as originally outlined, um, mentions four key principles. Domain-oriented domain ownership, data as a product, self-service shared infrastructure, and the federated governance. The first two of the, of the principles uh, come quite together and more or less in turn inform the other two, three and four. Three and four we can consider there are more um, te technological approaches or te technical solutions uh, that come hand in hand with the first two principles. So the first principle is domain-oriented domain ownership. Uh, this is an organizational principle to align organization and engineering into the same business domain. This is not new. Uh, we already saw that with domain-driven design, which uh, fostered um, the wide adoption of microservices as of today. And, but le let's consider here, from the perspective of data products, we can have different types of domains. Uh, for example, uh, some, some domains could be source-oriented, so, so oriented to the source of the data. Uh, another domain can be more aggregated, but we could also have more uh, uh, customer-centric domain. Like, for example, um, think about any uh, tabular model that needs to be um, available for reporting, right? Um, this all uh, this principle and this reorganization has big implications because we need to combine the skills and knowledge of engineers and domain experts inside the, the same data domain. That means we need this to decentralize the data capabilities. And, and why are we doing that? Uh, this is to bring the responsibility and the ownership uh, of the data to the team that is closest to where the data is actually being generated and providing value. Um, this in turn, increases the quality and the quality of service. And finally, the resembling structure that we can see here um, needs to resemble more the typical value chain uh, structure uh, that the company provides to its uh, customers and users. The teams in this way are empowered to innovate and to make changes at their own speed. Okay, let's go with the second principle, which is data as a product. Uh, a data product, we could define a data product as a set of um, processes and data that produce externally consumable data, uh, and these all align the same problem in the business domain. So basically, in a data product, in, in a domain data product, we can see several input ports. Basically, these input ports are um, the different upstream systems or uh, produce or, or, or other produ data producing application, right? And the output ports are basically um, responsible for consuming the data. So they just focus on consuming the data. So the domain data product just focuses on making this data available, right? For through these ports, um, the consumers here don't need to care about how this data is being is being produced. Just how it, to consume the data, right? On top of input and output ports, we also have uh, some some other stuff, right? Some other artifacts that the domain data products need, need to provide. For example, they need to um, to provide the metadata, all the relevant metadata out of their data, but also metrics and logs. Okay, uh, this is the result of uh, applied product thinking to data. Um, so in the end, uh, we need to provide with a domain of, uh, as a product or or data product. We need to provide basically. Um, capabilities as a product with everything that the product encompasses and I will cover in the next slides. Um, also, it, it's a way in the end of packaging the not only the data and the metadata, but also the code, the infrastructure of to in order to produce all this data, right? But um, a data product is not just input and output ports there needs to be some kind of uh, governance standards and some capabilities uh, for the products to be a part of this uh, domain-driven approach. 
uh, we, what we have what we call the DATSYS principles, which is a set of characteristics that any data product needs to fulfill in, inside this data mesh. So we have, for example, the principle of discoverable. Uh, it needs to be the, the product data product needs to be discoverable through a data catalog. We also have uh, addressable. Uh, so basically, the product should follow some kind of global conventions for being accessed. The product should be trustworthy. Uh, this means that the um, uh, there should be some kind of quality standards, but not only that, also service standards, SLOs, and so on. Of course, security uh, with um, basically federated security and, um, and access control that is gran granular enough. Interoperable, so basically uh, the, the, we should try to follow open standards and add multiple interfaces to serve the data. And self-describing, yes, a product schema should be shared and the documentation should be updated, uh, as well as uh, the input and the output port should be listed correctly. So we, we saw in the past, right, the, this idea of moving from project to product, even beyond data, right, so outside of the data domain. So the same principle or the same journey needs to apply here, right? There needs to be a journey to um, move towards a product with a product thinking principles. Uh, for example, we saw some trends like API first, where different departments in, in even internal departments in the company communicate one with another uh, to via APIs to try to reduce the sociability factor, right, of their architectures and, and, and their teams. Uh, here, when we say about product thinking, we have um, very nice best practices, like, for example, the most important one is probably uh, prioritizing according to the delivery of business value. But of course, we have customer focus, uh, multi-directional feedback, uh, measure success continuously, um, continuous delivery, so focus relentless on delivery. Uh, one, te one team basically need to have you need to have cross-functional teams, right, uh, and autonomous teams for for delivering the products and also continuous improvement and innovation. Okay, so we have seen the first two principles, right, domain-oriented ownership and data as a product. So now let's explore the other two. Um, self-service shared infrastructure and federated governance. So the self-service shared infrastructure in the end, uh, the idea behind that is to lower the technological barrier to produce and to consume data and uh, to create and to consume data products. Uh, the platform is perceived as a domain agnostic operational platform that is um, utilized by all, by all teams and, and is shared across domains. Uh, watch out here, because when we say shared, it does not need, it does not need uh, to be centralized, right? Uh, several services can be centralized, but other services don't need to be centralized, and we could somehow federate. We will see next in the fourth principle. In any case, uh, the governance of all this is the key glue to enable interoperability. And again, as we are touching some well-known principles uh, for um, application management, we can see here platform, platform thinking. Uh, in the end, the platform thinking is a platform to mediate right, between producers and consumers. We have the same here. Um, and we need to produce exactly the same effort, the same effect, right, of, of network and, and increased consumption and increased transactions here. Uh, so the, we need to define our success criteria. In this case, is lowering the lead time to create a, a new data product. But not only that, also we need through platform thinking, we need to alleviate the skills issue issue in the long term. Why, why I'm saying that is because if we split uh, and reorganize the skills and the teams in uh, specific domain teams, we may run the risk that we are just duplicating uh, effort of key um, technical people that, that are scarce, right? And this would absolutely not work. So we need to think it wisely. We need to think where to set the skills and the capabilities to have some kind of uh, central layer of capabilities, but also uh, define which are the specific domain skills uh, that, and, and uh, in this case, data engineering in general skills that we need to have in each of the domains. Okay, so after we have seen the, the third, uh, the third um, principles, sorry, the, 
uh, let's explore the principle four, which is federated governance. So federated governance basically um, embraces decentralization while keeping being interoperable through some global standards. So the moment we uh, decentralize the data ownership and the responsibility of serving the data, uh, we need to provide some kind of autonomy to the teams, right? And this autonomy can only come through some level of standardization. Here, there is an important trade-off. And in the equation, we have three things. We have interoperability, we have flexibility, but also, very important, we have cost saving, right? Cost saving uh, that will uh, determine how much duplication of infrastructure, or duplication of processes, etc., we can allow, right, in the platform. Um, so most probably uh, in, in, data mesh, in data meshes, basically, uh, we need to centralize data quality and data governance policies. At least there should be a set of critical um, data governance policies. So for example, naming conventions for the data sets, uh, paths, uh, data modeling uh, guidance, uh, transformation frameworks, uh, technical systems or standards, uh, documentation format, glossary, all these things we need to consider uh, that there, need, there will need to be some kind of uh, central layer of governance, but uh, and as, that, as such, they will need to be centrally managed by a central team, but probably we could delegate uh, some of the more domain-specific governance to the teams. Okay, so after seeing these two principles or see these two first uh, sections and the, the latter one with the principles, let's explore the key considerations. So data mesh is not a technology. Um, data, data mesh has to do a lot with data governance and this goes down to different dimensions. We have organization, we have processes, we have technology, uh, people and also data, of course. So data mesh is not really about a prescriptive approach in a technology or in a vendor or in a specific architectural framework. Um, we have seen right with the first two principles that um, there's a lot about change management, right? There, we need a paradigm shift also on the organization side of things and, and people side of things. So we need to put in place some change management practices. So for example, we need to, um, to choose an early success in the company. So probably just gather a domain, um, implement some kind of uh, KPIs that you want to track, then start rolling out, learn from your mistakes. And then from there, you, can, you are able to, um, to, <clears throat> yeah, to get the buy-in basically of other parts of the organization, other domains to get into the same uh, organization. But also incentives. Uh, you need to put in incentives in place. Uh, and, and, and I'm speaking about KPIs, OKRs, right? All this needs to be in the objectives of the people. Then uh, we have yeah, another principle that, uh, well, it's, a, it's an agile principle about building evolutionary architectures. In the end, uh, it, it means that we need to give freedom to evolve right to for all this platform. But we need a target to evolve towards. Definitely, if we don't have that target, uh, then uh, we would not be assessing the right um, setup, right, and the right architecture that we need for uh, our data mesh. Also, it has to do a lot with processes, DevOps, data ops best practices in general, right? So all this just sums up. And finally, knowledge and skills management. Why? Because, yeah, as I mentioned, you, we will probably need to shift skills from one place to the other. Otherwise, this upskilling may not be scalable. Another important uh, consideration is that data mesh is not for everyone. So if your company is already well functioning, even if it has or is based on a pure uh, monolithic central data lake or data warehouse, but there are no frictions um, among the team, there are no big handoffs, um, there's frictionless collaboration to serve the business, then probably it's not the time to start uh, such a change. But of course, there can always be different situations where we may need uh, to, to start thinking that. Okay, 
another another consideration is there is not a, a data mesh so basically data mesh is not a prepackaged architectural concept and as such it can have many different phases uh, so we can see actually definitions of data mesh that has that have several levels of decentralization so if data mesh is basically kind of a um, technique to decentralize, so to decentralize this ownership of data, this serving of data, um, we can have a spectrum, right, of data meshes where um, each of, of the of the parts can have um, pros and cons. So, for example, uh, we may um, we may feature a data mesh where uh, a data lake imports all the raw data. This data can be can be given access to, for example, to knowledgeable users, right? But um, we also use some parts or some pieces to decentralize, to push this uh, raw data to more decentralized data warehouses, uh, when some, where someone closer to the business does the transformation on the data. So in this case, for example, in this picture, we, have, we, we can see an example of a more or less um, centralized data mesh, or, or that data mesh that has some level of centralization here, at least on the raw layer. But um, Another option, for example, you could feature a data mesh where uh, the infrastructure is maintained with a bunch of different storage technologies like uh, Blob, RDS, whatever, and basically different storage technologies in a kind of a catalog, right, of um, of a num of, of a finite number of options, um, and every, the team can decide what the domain team basically can decide which one to use. But in any case, they really need to respect the a set of common metadata guidelines and best practices inside each of the technical choices. Um, here is super important that everything is uh, documented and there's um, a proper data catalog for, for every, every uh, product and every transformation and interaction that is being uh, is taking place in the in the data mesh. So, what does a technical approach need to offer to be compatible with these principles? Um, the data mesh does not only distribute data, and as such, it needs to be regarded as a general application integration framework. And I'll explain why. In the end, it, it needs to provide several use cases of application integration, uh, and this goes even beyond the data itself. For example, let's see that we need to enable some output ports for consuming read-only data, um, for example, exposing a tabular or a relational model. But then uh, for another use case, let's say, let's say that we need to have some uh, synchronous API to consume and operate on the data that is directly, directly coming from the upstream applications. Or, for example, we need to enable a set or a chain of services that integrate one with another through event sorting uh, so this would not well, basically it would be around here um, but so for example let, let's say that we have a set of our chain of uh, services that are integrated through event sorting based on the data that is coming from the business applications and also on the eda eda approach let's see that let's say that we have um that we need to provide some kind of um, alert right based on the events that are consumed through streaming okay so in the end uh, whatever we use cases we have here we, what we need to see the our data mesh is as a platform to blend the different patterns of uh, general application integration architectures uh, for example service oriented or um, ada or read data store and then on top of that right besides all these application integration uh, patterns as with any uh, modern application, we need to provide transversal DevOps and data ops capabilities that are associated to non-functional requirements. What can be these non-functional requirements? So basically the elasticity, the extensibility, um, access control, of course, discoverability, and uh, automated deployments and updates. So, how we need to see in the end uh, this uh, self-service infrastructure is as a common toolbox so uh, of loosely coupled uh, 
tools, right? It's, it's a, where it's a, long, it's a landscape that is a little bit loosely coupled uh, and uh, of tools that require little uh, to no maintenance. And we can see different dimensions inside this toolbox. On one hand, for example, for data discovery, we will need probably capabilities for searching on the catalog, a metadata catalog service, a lineage, basically to track to where the data was coming from and also try to spot possible uh, root causes of issues in the data. Definitely, we need a scalable storage and compute, right? Um, then we also have uh, data governance, so security, access control, management, federated identity. On the data build, common blueprints, use cases for transformations and model training. And then definitely on data operations, we have infrastructure as code, logging, monitoring, DevOps, model management, and so on. So now let's explore a use case. Um, it's a company in the real estate sector, and the scenario is similar to what was described before. So basically, the data is scattered in silos um, uh, in, in different operational databases that are owned by the IT team, by a central IT team. But as the business grows, there is a higher demand for interoperability and making this data available to create new products and business models. So what we need is to have the data in the correct model and format uh, to serve different use cases. So, for example, we could have um, we could have a, a 360 product view that uh, needs to be fueled uh, through, for example, a search engine in the web. But we could also have some B2C, B2B portals that tap on, on aggregated and consolidated data, and in turn they can trigger transactions, um, manage portfolio, and so on. And also, we may need here um, an, an endpoint, a data, a data science model. A data, a data, sorry, an endpoint with a data science model that um, eases the decision making, by, um, like for example, um, detecting anomalies, right, on the valuation of inventory. So what we need basically is to build a data mesh of use cases that better resemble this uh, business model and value chain, right, that the company provides to to business and consumers. And also we need to have different products as APIs for further integration across the company, right. So this data mesh approach, what it does is enables the creation of a multi-interface data layer of interoperable data products. Uh, for example, this, tab this uh, relational model that um, fuels the search engine on the web, or these APIs that these portals consume, or the data model that the endpoint um, serves. From the architectural perspective, the solution that we use is our Sidra, uh, our plain concept Sidra data platform as the shared infrastructure that is compatible with these principles. And let's see just the building blocks here. Sidra provides just as one piece a centralized data lake for raw data in optimized format. So it can be um, channeled to different use cases. Uh, the access management here needs to be granular enough. The access management to this data lake needs to be granular enough uh, to, uh, to all the domain teams. And each business case is therefore a domain. And in Sidra, it takes the form of the so-called client applications. And on top, Sidra supports the data storage units, which is basically independent deployable components for all the data intake orchestration services. Let's go to the concept of client application a little bit more in depth. Uh, each client application is just a full blueprint implementation of uh, the, this data layer that we saw in the previous slide. And each uh, client application has full interoperability with the data lake. So for example, in our case, we could see that we have one client application um, owned by a domain that serves the needed data for this B2C portal and also probably for this um, um, for this search engine on the web, for example, via um, via an, an indexing service, right? Then we could have another client application, customer portal, which in turn um, uh, has or exposes an API that can be used uh, in this portal. And here in Data Lab, we could have um, yeah, a, a client application that basically exposes a kind of a sandbox for exploratory data analysis purposes, but also helps on the training of the model. And just one note here, just for the cost saving, uh, for the cost uh, saving, um, we could reuse some infrastructure. So if there's no exactly need to split into separate domains, we could just, for example, uh, share some of the um, some some of the resources. For example, SQL elastic, elastic pools and also the data orchestration, and consider this as just one client application, but serve exactly the same use cases that we have seen before. 
a little bit more about um, about accelerators. So basically, um, all these client applications are interoperable and able to follow these uh, governance rules. Um, we need accelerators to build automated pipelines, orchestration as code, management APIs, um, a web UI, an extensive metadata API, and a data catalog for discoverability. And of course, all the different um, provision environments or provisioning capabilities for environments. So just to finalize, to wrap up here, uh, three key take takeaways right, for building a data mesh. One is that you need to set up cross-functional domain teams, um, assign even a product, uh, a product owner uh, in, in each of these domains, um, and apply product thinking with data. Next, you need to set up some data management and data governance and to ease the, the, the need for or to alleviate the need for experts, people you can put in place policies, tooling and automation. And also, finally, you need to set up in place the self-service compatible platform to lower the barrier of usage and empower teams. Thank you.